Greetings, and welcome to the Thirsty Mage, the pub where friends get together for a pint and a discussion about our favorite RPGs. Tonight is a special Know Your Developer episode. Instead of going through the hours of research, uh, the subject was kind enough to send us their CEO and game director. I'd like to welcome uh, to the show uh, Ben from Snowcastle Games. Hi, David. Thank you. Um, quite excited to be here. Great to, great to have uh, the information straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> no w- Wikipedia search in and source review, and it's great. I could just ask you the straight up questions. And yeah, I uh, I'll try to uh, uh, make as much sense as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah, it's always fun uh, talking to people who make uh, RPGs and and get a background look at. All the all the rough and the tough work that goes into making uh, the games that we enjoy. So, yeah, I'm glad glad to have you. Yep. So, uh, so Snowcastle created Earthlock. It's uh, an RPG that released on the Switch uh, a little over a month ago uh, on all major platforms, actually, not not just the Switch. And uh, so we're gonna go over. I got a few questions about uh, how how um, the process worked and and things about behind the scenes stuff. But uh, before we start. On the show, we always talk about uh, what we're drinking at the pub, uh, but unfortunately, it's uh, it's about 11 a.m. my time, and and Ben's still at work uh, <laughs> over over in Norway. So uh, technically, it's neither of us are drinking. But uh, what I'll do, I'll just change up the question a bit. Maybe just ask him. Uh, I've always been trying to plan a, a trip to Europe, and uh, Norway is is one of the countries uh, that I'd like to visit, and. Uh, I guess that is if there's a, a beer out there that I should get if I manage to make my way up up there. Is there is there anything that I, I can't can't leave Norway without trying? <laughs> yeah, um, there's recently been a lot of uh, microbreweries. Uh, there used to be just like two major breweries in Norway, uh, and then we imported a lot of uh, Belgium Belgian beer. Uh, but there's one particular that's quite famous and rather expensive, but also really tasty. And it's called the Naked Eye Island, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, uh, in Norwegian, uh, yeah. and it comes in quite large bottles and uh, is very good. So definitely, if you come here, you should try the Naked Island. <laughs> sounds great. I got to get out there eventually. It's it's. Uh... Europe is basically where where all the best beer is, and that, that's, a, that's my opinion. Maybe kind of the the home of where beer started. So yeah, that's that's where I want to get out. So one day, I gotta save, save up my money. Yeah, you can get a interrail ticket, so you can just go by train. Uh, you pay for you have one train ticket that lasts for a month, for example, and you can just just, just go all over Europe. That's good. Yeah. Alrighty. Uh, so maybe uh, before we get into the the background stuff, maybe if you just want to let the, view, the listeners know uh, just what Earthlock is, and maybe just give us a a quick pitch of uh, why why we should be playing it. Yeah, uh, Earthlock is a uh, RPG uh, inspired by the classic three D RPGs of uh, the nineties, uh, PlayStation Two era, uh, and. Uh, we tried to to create the same feeling that we remembered having while playing that uh, those games back then, except on in a new way uh, or in a new console. Um, and uh, we also tried to add some new takes on, for example, turn-based combat and character progression. So, uh, oh, and we have a uh, little island base where you can grow spuds and plants and fruits, and you're equipped with a spud gun. So there's your ammunition. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that was what was actually one of my uh, favorite parts of Earthlock was the, the kind of like your sanctuary yeah. where you can. It's nice to get away from uh, from the evil combat occasionally and just uh, chill out. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Get a get a little quick farming simulator in to rebuild your weapon stock. And yeah, I'm just curious about how Snowcastle Games uh, began and and how uh, the dev team uh, ended up uh, together. Yeah, uh, we started Snowcastle back in 2009. Uh, I think we were like four people back then. Uh, Eric, my partner, and Fritz, uh, the art director, and a programmer who's no longer with us. Uh, and then we uh, did lots of flash games for a Norwegian television company uh, to start with. Uh, and then uh, we didn't have any funds, 
So we had to do some work for hire, uh, and then slowly we managed to build a, a team. And we're now uh, 11 people here in Oslo, and uh, I've got another uh, three external uh, people. And a lot of them really know how knows how to make game games. Actually, all of them by now. Um, so it's uh, it's been a a long. It's been nine years. Oh my god! <laughs> I, I just looked at. Oh wow! Yeah. So um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's how I get that feeling every day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You're oh, looking man. at the calendar, going, "Is it really 2018?" Yeah. Uh, and uh, making Earthlock uh, took five years, and we didn't have uh, any income, so we had to uh, get money from friends, fools, and family, and and some the odd investor. And uh, just scrape by with a little fund, as little fund as possible. Uh, also, the Norwegian government has uh, some really nice um, funds for films and computer games, so we managed to tap into that as well. And we had a Kickstarter, so all of that uh, enabled us to get the game out in five years. That was in 2016, and then we launched the game on Switch just recently. So after we launched the game first on uh, Xbox and PlayStation and Steam, we uh, spent a few months working on Earthlock 2, the next game in the same universe. And then we had this growing feeling that the game wasn't quite where we wanted it to be. And so we stopped making Earthlock 2 and then went back to Earthlock 1. And we said, okay, so there's a Switch coming out and we should probably get it out on that platform as well. And what will it take to make the game like how it should be with everything that we had to cut uh, during the uh, initial production and from the feedback we got from the community and stuff. And so we budgeted another seven, eight months. And then 13 months later, we were done. <laughs> uh, but now the game is where we want it to be it feels uh, more fleshed out more whole uh, more fun uh, so that's good that's great so on our show what we usually do is go back and look at our favorite rpgs but we usually start with the the people that made them so as the game director uh, you're our perfect starting off point i was wondering if you could maybe just give us a little bit of uh history on some of the work that you've worked on and maybe some of your influences and inspiration? Yeah, um, Earthlock is uh, our second game. The first one was called uh, Hogworld. It was a small adventure game uh, for kids on iOS. We did back in 2011. Uh, we got some really nice reviews on that game. I think Apple put us on the best of 2000 something lists uh, for Christmas. And we didn't make much money at all. <laughs> uh, I've heard that about mobile games. Yeah, uh, and we didn't want to yeah. do free-to-play or uh, we couldn't put ads in the game. We, did, we wanted to make a premium game, um, and uh, that was really hard to sell. But uh, it was a, it was a, the first story told in the Earthlock universe, because the character in Hogworld was a little hog bunny uh, a mix of a rabbit and a hog. Uh, called Nart, and he's a mage in Earthlock. So he stayed alive through that game and into the next one, and uh, likely into the next one. <laughs> That's good. It's all canon, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, yeah prior to that, uh, I didn't work on making games, but I worked with analyzing games at a studio called, or a company called uh, Game Explorer, where we uh, made a database uh, with computer games and uh, gameplay elements in it in them and we also created two books uh, in 2006 and 2007 called book of games volume one and volume two nice books didn't sell much <laughs> <laughs> um that's me fritz fritz, uh, fritz olsen is the the art director i guess he was one of the main people in in that kind of gave the feel and look of earth oh yeah uh, fritz uh, the the art and feel of Earthlock is uh is very much uh Due to Fritz, uh, he's an extremely talented uh, artist. He came on board uh, back in when I had Game Explorer, and he was, I think, 16 years old. He came in as a tester who tested video games and, and uh, answered all the questions about gameplay. Uh, and then he showed me his drawings, and he was just back then super talented, but uh, a bit rough in the edges. And, and then I suggested he should 
go to some awesome game development school and he did and then uh, some years later in 2009 he came back just when I started Snowcastle so that was perfect timing oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Mm, and then uh, we got a uh, few uh, senior developers. I was lucky enough to get a phone call in December a few years back when uh, we were really pushing the finances, uh, or it was really tough on the finances. And uh, I got a call from a very talented and nice guy called Thomas, who was married to a Norwegian woman, but he was living in Scotland and been working at a company called um, Rockstar for 10 years oh yeah. yeah as a programmer and game designer and i was like well yes i got a job for you i just need to find some money first uh okay. and uh uh he's been super with all that uh with those 10 years of experience from a, a big company uh he managed to level up uh pretty much everybody in the company uh over the next year and then we got uh, several other uh, people now also uh, with the experience and uh, some new ones uh, who came in as interns and then uh, afterwards became junior designers. So a mix. That's great. And uh, I noticed uh, the composer for Earthlock is a fellow Canadian. Oh yeah, Aiko. She is a unique rare talent. Uh, a friend of Fritz, I think, from his university days uh she plays i think 32 instruments uh and just super multi-talented and sings as well and she does uh, uh typically composes the music and then records each instrument by herself into like this old orchestra uh so yeah she's been a, a super fine and and she's been she's been with us from from the early days when we made hogworld she made beautiful music for that game and and continued making music for uh earthlock yeah, it's good uh good that she it's that she's a friend of the art director yeah <laughs> because there's <laughs> obviously could be some collaboration there of if she's looking for kind of direction or inspiration i suppose then it's good to know to be the buddy of the art director of the game yeah and and also it's it's nice every time we go to game developers conference in San Francisco she she tend to come down and and help us man the booth and hang out so even though we're on the other side of the planet we can still see each other from time to time <laughs> that's great yeah so maybe we'll start getting into the the nitty gritty of the process and um, I was going to ask you about um, uh, you were talking about how difficult it is for uh, when you're in game design finding funding and and man, you know keeping keeping things afloat yeah uh and, and you had decided to go th uh, through kickstarter for uh, a portion of the money anyway um i was wondering if if uh, you could give me some kind of like a bit of insight on how like the kind of the decision process behind like using kickstarter as a platform and yeah uh we uh back in what was that uh 2013 uh we had made a uh, prototype of the game. We showed it at PAX uh, West in Seattle. Got really good response and then we went on Steam Greenlight and got greenlit in 14 days and we got pretty cocky. At the same time we were also really low on funds so it was like okay I didn't quite think it was within our reach but with uh, all this positivity let's try Kickstarter. Uh, that might just save us. Uh, and so we started a Kickstarter in mid-November which is epic bad timing. You don't do Kickstarter uh, in just around Thanksgiving and the Christmas holiday. People are thinking about oh, that. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, budgets are tight for everyone. Oh yeah. Here. So halfway th yeah. uh, through that one, we just stopped it and said, okay, we're gonna regroup and uh, do another one in in March. Uh, we did some more homework and uh, and launched a new campaign in March, and that went really well. So uh, we got um, hundred and. Seventy-eight thousand dollars, and uh, that back then seemed like a lot of money. Uh, that would bring us really close to completing the game. Now, in hindsight, uh, I can see that that fund is less than ten percent of the actual cost of the development. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> so yeah, it's uh, it's uh, enormously expensive having. Uh, 10 people or 15 people work full-time 
for a whole year with offices and everything. Uh, but we got the game out uh, and uh, we also have, uh, with the Kickstarter money, you also get a Kickstarter uh, crowd of uh, very friendly people, uh, for some Kickstarters, that is. Uh, and I think the ruler is that you need to keep your backers informed of what you do. And if you do that, uh, they seem to be really nice and helpful and less of the angry sort. Uh, I have looked at a few other Kickstarter campaigns, not of ours, and uh, seen that there's they can go really sour if you don't do your... Um, crowdfunding work properly yeah well it's you can see like there's um i know like some of the people on our site have funded different kickstarter projects and uh they don't always work out either no so that's that's part of it too is i i think the some people can be a little wary of going on kickstarter just because of the risk involved of yeah, but that that's that's the point with Kickstarter because otherwise a lot of those projects would never happen. Uh, like for us, for example, when we came to March that year in 2014, we were really at the edge of any finance, uh, <laughs> any uh, any finances we had, uh, and I couldn't wrestle out more uh, private funding. Uh, we were likely to get a grant from the Norwegian government, but only if we could get some more money. And so, so I would. I was at that point that if the Kickstarter failed, the company would be bankrupt. And that was 2014. I had already put five years of my life in the company and all my savings. So that was stressful. Uh, but the Kickstarter was successful and we got the funds from Kickstarter and topped up with the funds from the government. So that was a double win. Mm. That's, that's very interesting to me because uh, I, I, yeah, I even know people who kind of think, well, you know, the Kickstarter... I don't think they realize how much like the Kickstarter is only a portion. Like I think some people kind of look at it and think like that's well, you got your funding. Where's the games? You know, and not understanding. Like when you said it was less than ten percent of the total cost. Like I was like, wow, that's <laughs> yeah. And I, at that point, I worked with games for five years, and uh, I still uh, underestimated how expensive it would be to to complete the game the first time and then we had to complete it again <laughs> for the second time uh, so yeah uh the problem with, with games is that uh you can't design it on paper you need to play and test it and if it isn't fun you, the game isn't done you need to go back and redo it uh and so it's really hard to plan properly um but with Kickstarter, that's I think that's what's very important for people to remember is when you back someone on Kickstarter, you're backing them. You're not buying their game. You're backing them. It's a massive difference. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very important distinction, really. Yeah, um, yeah, because because that's kind of the feeling I think most people go in with is that you're buying the game, and it's like no, you're backing them. You're not buying it. You're buying their so dream. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's very important. That kind of segues into. Um, like the community, like when you when you go on Kickstarter, you're kind of selling an idea to to backers. Did you feel any kind of pressure or like guidance of like the communities pushing in one direction and maybe like did you feel any kind of that or was it more just you know just a bunch of people saying you know rah rah let's get the game? Yeah, uh, quite a bit of impatience, of course. Uh, it's like I backed the game. Why isn't it done yet? Uh, you promised it. Uh, within a year and it's now been three years uh, <laughs> uh, but well, fortunately we had informed people uh, regularly like okay so we're done this uh, this is delayed we're trying to get this done uh, and just communicating at least like uh, once every two one or two months uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so even though some people get were getting really impatient they were losing their patience and that was a big difference um, but for the most part, uh, I, we've gotten lots of like constructive ideas from the community, but no one like demanding that we do this or that, or we couldn't do this or that. And I think that's, that's positive. I mean, getting uh, suggestions and creativity from your community is super awesome, uh, but having people tell you what to do is uh, less ideal. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's one of the things I've noticed. Um, I I wasn't sure if it was 
prevalent in Kickstarter is is that uh, a lot of the indies there's uh, the nostalgia factor kind of comes into play with a lot of indie developers where people kind of they have an idea of what they used to play and and kind of want something like that and I, I wonder how much the developers when they're making games kind of wrestle with that nostalgia versus Oh yeah, the new thing that they're trying to. Yeah, it's it, that's to... really hard. Uh, for example, we had a long, long debate on having uh, uh, save points, save statues instead of just saving anywhere, because saving anywhere is what people are used to now. Uh, but save statues are, they have a gameplay feature because uh, if you if you can only save at the start of a dungeon uh, and then you have to go through the dungeon and defeat the boss. It's not just the boss, it's like preserving your resources and getting through to the boss is also part of the whole beating the boss gameplay. And so we chose that, and uh, that makes the game really difficult for people like me who have children to play for 10 minutes and then put down, because you can't save. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so there's the pros and cons to that. Uh, and uh, at the same time... Uh, I think we succeeded in in, uh, in creating that old feeling, uh, that good good old school feeling, without being completely old school. Uh, I got a lot of people writing to us, telling us that we managed to bring, give them exactly that feeling they had when they were playing games in the '90s, except it looks modern and and um, uh, and plays on their current console. Um, so, um, for for those people, I think we uh, achieved what we set out to do, and then we've had people who uh, don't get the why we have safe statues because they, they're young; they never had, they never played a game with safe statues, <laughs> <laughs> and it's just for them, it's just like, oh, it's so lame. Why can't I just save when I want to? Um, and uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't think you can make a game that pleases everybody. No, that makes sense. We've actually had, uh, even at our at their site, staff will be debating the pros and cons of different design choices and that sort of thing. Like you said, it's um, it's funny with, with the save feature because, um, you know, one person could say, uh, well, the save statues are there because they couldn't figure out how to save anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, uh, I don't know if that's why, like, no. uh, but I, I can, I totally get the, the design factor of it because... Um, like you said, uh, you could be in a dungeon and you could get to the boss and save in front of the boss and then just keep playing the boss over and over till you beat them so, as opposed to it being like a, a full, like you go in and like you said, save resources and that's so saving resources. And, yeah. It, yeah, so, yeah, that makes sense. It, yeah, it, it is a different challenge, but it's also, uh, uh, of course, if you, like when we first launched the game and there were some bugs that caused it to crash, then save statues are extremely annoying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think uh, we're going to um, uh, seriously consider uh, our saving features for our next game. Uh, the, the point is also, uh, is it fun? That's like the m- most important question I think a game designer needs to ask uh, him or herself when making a game. This thing mm-hmm. I'm doing, or this feature I'm adding to the game, is it fun? And um, yes, I think, uh, f- for example, as we're talking about safe statues, they're fun in terms of getting that uh, uh, challenge of beating uh, a, a dungeon and a boss. But they're not fun when you have 30 minutes to play, and or 10 minutes to play, or 20 minutes to play, and you can't save, and you got to leave, and then you have to replay it. Because replaying the same thing all, all, all over again isn't fun. So, yeah, th- that kind of goes into a, another debate we were having too of um, difficulty versus accessibility. Yeah, yeah, and and I I, I personally lean on the difficulty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and that, that's what we do too. That's I mean, uh, Thomas, our lead uh, game designer, uh, he is super into hardcore self brutalizing games like uh, Bloodborne and. Uh, <laughs> stuff like that and uh, he really wants the hardest challenges uh, and uh, if you look at the art for Earthlock it looks like a quite cute like f- child friendly game 
Um, and especially with, uh, the first time we launched the game, uh, it, some of the bosses were really brutal. If you didn't figure out how to use the right tactics, he would just annihilate you. <laughs> okay. is, is, so I'm guessing I, I didn't play the yeah. first first version of it, but I'm guessing then the because um, I know in this uh, like in on the Switch, if if you're defeated by the boss when you reappear at the save statue, the uh, I can't remember his name. The little the frog, boy. frog guy. Yeah, frog boy. Yeah, frog boy. Kind of gives you the the hint of uh, maybe you should have done this. Yes, uh, this <laughs> is stuff that we uh, added based on community responses. Chris, it's like for some people, uh, it's highly frustra frustrating if you guide them. They don't want an arrow telling you where to go. They don't want you to help them. They want to figure it out themselves. And then on the other side, you have people who get super frustrated. If there isn't an arrow that they can follow, they want to be like guided through the game. And mm -hmm. so adding Frog Boy was a way to help those who felt like they needed some extra help uh, without forcing it on those who didn't want it. Because you, you can choose not to talk to him and just fight the boss again. So you can get the hints or you can avoid getting the hints. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like you said, it's hard to... Everybody's got their way of playing so it's yeah trying to find ways to please everyone i guess it's not not easy yep so you were saying uh when when it first released i guess there were some some features that you felt were like when you first released their thought at the when the kickstarter was done at the time did you feel like the, the final product was what oh you yeah envisioned? yeah yeah we were super happy we were super proud uh and just uh, having completed the game and it was playable and uh we thought it was challenging which is always something you should worry about if you, as a developer, find the game challenging. <laughs> the players will find it super challenging. Uh, but uh, we, um, we, yeah, we were super happy. We had made a lot of cuts, and because we'd been working with this for so long, like five years, uh, we knew all the characters by heart and, and what they, like, where they came from and what they were doing and why they were doing it. Uh, so when we cut out parts of the game that we couldn't, uh, didn't have time to, 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 to like, put in there. Uh, we cut out parts of the story that for people who didn't know all that we knew really made it hard for them to understand what was going on or uh, follow the main narrative, uh, the plot holes that made stuff not make sense. Uh, the, the female protagonist, Ive, came out as uh, rather uh, spoiled and not very nice when she's a really nice person. So uh, one of the first things we did was rewrite the dialogue and her uh, behavior in the first five, 10 minutes of the game to, to show her as she is. Um, uh, and that helped a lot. Um, but then also there was like places where we simply hadn't had time to make all the things we wanted. So there wasn't any side quests and and less interactivity in general. And so that was what we spent the last 13 months doing, was like adding side quests and mini games and, and silly stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, you can, you, can, uh, you can find some seeds that you can plant and then there will grow a kitten tree that would spawn small kittens that you'll just jump around and do nothing but look cute, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I think that that's that's important to to have that time for a polish and add those silly, fluffy, uh, funny things. Yeah, it's a, a lot of times it's the small details that can really kind of push a game. Yeah, from being from enjoying it, not the, you know like uh, people loving like almost not Easter eggs, but kind of just like the the fine details, like you said. Yeah. Uh, so I guess uh, I'll, I'll segue into the next. I was curious, as as an independent studio, I know it's it's very difficult to kind of get get your name out, get get the word out. I, I'm assuming that in the RPG genre, it's it's even that much more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we were lucky because we did the Kickstarter before it was super super hard to do Kickstarter. Uh, and so we got 5,000 backers and, and that definitely helped us get some attention. Um, mm -hmm. But as a no-name indie studio without any uh, previous games, it's really hard to get attention from the games press, media, uh, and uh, publishers and investors. So yeah, you, you, you kind of have to prove yourself. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, if you uh, if, then once you polish the game and you, you're like, okay, now I'm finally going to earn money, then you realize that um, you're not alone. Uh, there's a lot of <laughs> other indie developers out there. So the year we launched on Steam, there was two thousand no, four thousand two hundred seven new games on Steam. Like oh, and that was those games on uh, that was published in 2016 was 38 percent of the total number of games on Steam that year. And then the next year uh, in 2017, there was uh, almost double the amount of published games. So publishing a game on Steam is becoming more like making your own website and hoping to get lots of traffic for it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, and uh, this, the, what typically happens when we saw that happening on the iOS market back in 2011, and that is prices drops. And then all of a sudden it gets really hard to make good games and recoup your investment in the development. Um, at the same time, uh, we've also been compared to uh, visually uh, to, to AAA studios and AAA games. Uh, and then because we don't have, for example, voiceover, uh, some have been like, oh, but it's a trashy game because it doesn't have voiceover. Uh, and, and voicing our game would cost hundreds and thousands of dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it's, um, it's, it's uh, hard, but at the same time, it's also fun because you, you're working in an industry that changes and it's growing and there's so much happening. And the one of the best parts of being uh, in the in- game, indie game industry is that all the other indies are your competitors in one way, but they all seem to be really friendly and helpful and, and share information and uh, help each other. So we are we just have to learn quickly. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in, a, in a way, um, other indie success actually could spawn success for you. Like, you know, if, if someone who's kind of been an Atlas or Square Enix player and then they, they you know, are introduced to a good indie game and then maybe come to that realization that, hey, maybe there are other indie games that are good. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I can see how there'd be a little bit of camaraderie in the, the indie scene. Yeah. Um, yeah, back when we were publishing Earthlock uh, uh, for Xbox, we uh, had to get it through uh, all these... H rating certifications uh, and uh, the Australian one was specifically difficult because they wouldn't take anything digitally. We would have to send them physical discs and uh, physical DVDs with the video. Uh, and at the same time, they were having this, we were having a super tight deadline and they were doing some vacation time or something. So we had to get the disc to them from Norway to Australia in two days, which was even with the most expensive career, it was almost impossible. Uh, but fortunately, mm-hmm. some really nice people from an uh, uh, indie studio called Five Life Studio, um, former Bullfrog guys, uh, worked on a game called Syndicate back in in the old days, and then made a similar game now called uh, Satellite Rain. Um, they were so friendly, so they they helped us. I could just send them the all the, the binaries and the video, and they would burn it on a CD and DVD and, and ship it across the street. So we made the deadline. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was pretty crazy. Awesome. Yeah, that's a it's a good. Uh, that's what networking can do for you. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Making friends at those GDCs. Exactly. Uh, I guess the, one of the things about Earthlock I wanted to just uh, talk about a bit is I, I know in my experience uh, with RPGs, a lot of the time to get the most enjoyment out of it is is kind of when you've discovered the way the developer intended it to be played. Yes. Uh, I, I, I guess in, uh, one of my examples would be like, uh, I know in Radiant Historia, I, I just recently played that one and I had never played uh, a game with that like the, the grid system. Yeah. Uh, so I, I wasn't particularly enjoying it until I kind of figured out, uh, you know, the, the matching up people in squares and, and doing the combos and that sort of thing. And it kind of changed the whole experience for me. Um, so I was wondering if there's anything um, that new players to Earthlock maybe should uh, know that so that they, you know, they don't start it and maybe not quite getting it right away. If there's any kind of hints or 
or direction maybe of just like the best way to experience it? Yeah, I think uh, uh, trying out different things to figure out your play style. Uh, you can choose, each character has two stances, like uh, Eamon has a spud gun where you can shoot ranged uh, magic spuds and, and he has a thief stance where he can steal stuff and use his dagger. Uh, but then you have a talent tree where you build your character, uh, like the character progression. Um, and you, if you choose to go for magic and ranged, then of course you'll be much better at using your spud gun. Um, and uh, the same goes for the little hug bunny nerd. Uh, he can be have uh, uh, buffs and uh, offensive uh, magic, or he can be more defensive and healing magic. And it's quite interesting when you're fighting small critters uh, that aren't that hard. If you are aggressive, you can get really quickly through the combat. But if you're playing more defensive, it, they can take a bit longer. Um, so it really, really changed how you enjoy the game or how how fast paced you you feel it is, depending on on your strategy. Um, also, you can get to places. So there's a, a little creature, creature called magic creature called an Imkin, which is a nasty spellcaster. And um, uh, if you cast silence on that creature, uh, he's really easy to, to take down. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah. And the other thing uh, uh, I noticed too is that there's there's uh, a lot of focus on like the pairing system. Uh, it seems like a couple of the characters are, are more it's like because you've got the sharing of the the special yes uh that was quite funny because i had found my play style uh through the, the quality assurance period where we we're just playing the game playing the game trying to find bugs and then one day i was looking over the shoulder of one of the other guys and looking at him playing i was like what you're playing it all wrong <laughs> and he's like but i'm totally beating it I'm like, yeah okay <laughs> so um uh trying out different friendships and and uh their stances uh is quite interesting because there's really so many different uh variations to to setting up these six characters in two pairs i'm not going to get too many spoilers <laughs> yeah, no, makes sense. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, so I guess you, you kind of hinted at it early in the interview, but um, it sounded like uh, what's next for you guys is is a, a sequel to Earthlock. Yeah, uh, when we started the Kickstarter, we were uh, already uh, thinking about Earthlock as a as a game story world, a place that we we would have to explore uh, the, the everything over more than one game because it was just such a big planet and so weird a planet uh, it's a planet that has stopped spinning around its own axis so it's like one side is always facing the sun and one is uh, always in perpetual darkness and that creates a really weird world with big contrasts uh, between li light and dark and cold and warm um, and no sunset or uh, well like no time of day you can't really tell what time of day it is uh, because the sun is always there or not there um, and uh, so the Kickstarter we said we would make three games in this series and um, we stuck to that uh, and it's super exciting because there's so much stuff that we were thinking about in, in the while we made the first game that we couldn't do um, and, and for the next game we're gonna explore much more telling are showing and, uh, and letting you as a player interact with the, uh, uh, an environment where you can see the consequences of uh, the, the tidal lock of the planet. So like a city, how, how do you show that uh, or how does a city uh, enable themselves to sleep at night and get this day-night cycle? How do they know what time it is? Um, and, and so we've been looking at ways to to deal with that. For example, in Norway, there's a, a little city in a deep, deep valley uh, next to a power um, power plant, hydro plant, uh, that hardly sees any sun in October, November, December, January, and February. And in order to, to make life better for them, they have uh, installed a big array of mirrors on top of the local mountain that reflects oh, really? lights into the city 
And so one of those cities that are on the border of uh, where it's light and dark could, for example, have uh, a similar uh, mirror array uh, on a mountain or on a tower or something that would uh, reflect light into the city. And then, then you can manually turn them if you want it to be dark at night and then get them back in, uh, back in or turn them back when you want it to be morning. Um, mm -hmm. and, and how would plants react? Uh, plant, plants will also... Um, they like night and day cycle. And they breathe, at, breathe air at night and produce oxygen at, 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 in the sun, sunshine. And so can we make plants that behave and, and do stuff to show you as a player that, oh, it's actually night now in a way. It's, the 24-hour cycle is, is moving. Um, so that's something we didn't get to do in the first game, and that's something that we're exploring in the next game, which is quite exciting. Yeah, that's uh, it, well, and especially when you see um, the community reaction to something like Breath of the Wild, where uh, the fine details of the environment are like people are excited or they they do get into it. Uh, so that that does sound like a very interesting way to play. Yeah, you know, so. and also the first game we did as a homage to those awesome games games that we grew up playing. Uh, the next game, uh, we're doing a more contemporary game. So it's still going to be a role-playing game. We're going to have turn-based combat in one way or another. Um, but apart from that, we're kind of free to do uh, our own take on a contemporary role-playing game. So I can't say much more. We're still really, really early in the, the process. So nothing is really set in stone yet. <laughs> Well, it, it it already sounds interesting. So <laughs> we'll be we'll be watching for that. And, yeah, it, it, if you end up doing a Kickstarter for that, you you're gonna have to flip me an email. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot I, of work. I, I, I can be on board. Yeah, yeah. I, I can be on board with that. But hopefully, hopefully everything works out, so you don't you don't need that this time around. Yeah, I hope. Uh, it, it's fun doing a Kickstarter, but it's so hard. It's so so hard. <laughs> yeah. It probably takes for like five years of my life, so I, I'm not sure I'm going to do it again. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I wish uh, all the success uh, on the sequel, and uh, hopefully this helps uh, get some people uh, onto uh, Earthlock now so that they can uh, enjoy the game. Uh, is there any anything else uh, you wanted to say about uh Earthlock or well, I uh, if anyone plays Earthlock and uh, have feedback, uh, we're listening. Uh, you can send us tweets or emails or uh, post on Steam forum and and any other forum. Pretty much, we, we we lurk around and see see what's written most places, and we try to reply to uh, to anything we can. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so and and we really enjoy getting feedback. Uh, also, the negative feedback, if it's constructive and not just uh, <laughs> hatred. <Yeah. laughs> uh, so, do you, do you want to dare give your Twitter account? Yeah, uh, for Snowcastle, uh, it's, it's Snowcastle <laughs> Games. Um, it's just uh, yeah, at Snowcastle Games, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and Steam. And on Nint oh, we also have a um, Nintendo channel where we will be posting uh, uh, updates. Uh, little tidbits of uh, background story uh, from the Earthlock universe and, and uh, other uh, silly, interesting stuff. Um, so we just got it started uh, a few weeks ago. So you can follow us on your Switch as well. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Oh, and I guess we should tell everyone. So I imagine most people listening to our podcast probably have a Switch. And um, that's, for, to me, RPGs, it's just the perfect, the Switch is the perfect place because of that. When when I'm getting irritated at work and I need a break, then it's, <laughs> just flip out the switch and do some grinding in an RPG. Yeah. Um, but but for anyone who doesn't own a switch, it, uh, Earthlock is available on PS4, Xbox, and Steam. Yeah. But I I would recommend it on Switch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. Uh, yeah. It was it was like when we got the game on the Switch, uh, I was like, oh, it feels like it has landed at home now, having the game. Uh, uh, holding it in my hands like that was uh, that was a really good feeling. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and the bit, to me that the the bit, taking it with you um, is the big thing. Like I know, 
three like there's a lot of rpgs on 3ds and stuff but it's it's just so much different when you're kind of getting the the full hd in your hands yeah uh, wherever you go and then um the other part of the switch too that i enjoy is that uh, like you said w- with the saving feature like the save uh, statues yeah with the switch like if, if you're not as long as you're not moving games you can just put her in a sleep mode and yeah that's really good with the switch yeah so yeah i recommend uh if you got a switch then that that's where you should get it so oh um also on uh probably closer to christmas we will be inviting people to a small community to help start uh, checking out and uh play testing uh the next game uh and uh get feedback from them so uh, the idea is that over the next two and a half years we will be working with the community uh and trying out stuff and, and getting their feedback uh, on a regular basis. So, if you like Earth, nice if you like Earthlock uh, and want to help uh, uh, with the next game, then uh, yeah, sign up for our mailing list on snowcastle.no. Yeah, that's perfect. I, I know where I'll be emailing. Uh, <laughs> in a few minutes, so. Cool. <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, yeah, I wanted to thank you very much, Ben, for uh, taking the time to have a chat uh, with our podcast and thank you uh, helping uh lots of great insight uh, into how how much how difficult and how much work it is uh, building the game uh i i know it's easy for uh, uh, on the gaming side of it to to just kind of sit back and where's my game <laughs> so, <laughs> yep it's good it's good to to you know empathize with the amount of work and 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 appreciate it when it's when it's ready and it's good to go so thank you <laughs> and to just make sure everybody knows that you could follow us on twitter our handle is the thirsty mage we're also available on a subreddit if you'd like to engage in some discussion the subreddit is just the thirsty mage we'll be back in a couple of weeks we'll have a special review episode for a certain 3ds game that will be coming out shortly but until then Thanks again for listening to my interview with Ben from Snowcastle Games, and I'll see you at the next Thursday Mage.